I'm here with Matt Capusta, CEO and President of Unicure, who's going to give us a couple minutes overview of everything that's going on there. Matt. Great. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thanks to Piper and the, uh, the ARM organization for inviting us. Thanks for attending our presentation. I'm just going to spend about four or five minutes going through some high-level slides, and then, the, and then I think we'll slide into some, uh, some Q&A. Um, so as Steve said, I'm Matt Kappas, the Chief Executive Officer of Unicure. <clears throat> I'm based here in the, in the Boston area with about uh, 75 other employees uh, that primarily uh, operate our uh, state-of-the-art manufacturing facility in Lexington. Uh, I've been with the company for about two and a half years. Uh, despite the fact that Unicure in one form or the other has been actually in existence for about 20 years, and, and I think it's considered one of the pioneers within gene therapy. Um, I think over the course of probably 75% of that time, the company has invested very significantly in learning and developing a really strong core technology platform. Uh, and that technology platform includes vectorology and understanding of AAV, uh, AAV, AAV gene therapy, uh, as well as manufacturing capabilities. Um, I think uh, we've spent the last 10 years perfecting uh, an insect cell baclovirus uh, cell expression system uh, that we currently utilize in all of our development programs. Uh, we have the ability to scale up uh, to 500 liters uh, and the ability to scale out to 2,000 liters. Uh, and we have a fully operational facility, as I said, that is currently supporting our clinical programs. Uh, we're really focused on three areas in particular in development. Uh, those areas are uh, hemophilia B, where we are, uh, have an ongoing phase one, two study um, in 10 patients, uh, where we presented data at the end of December at the American Society of Hematology uh, with what we feel is a very successful clinical study. Uh, the second is in Huntington's disease where uh, earlier this week uh, we announced uh, some very interesting preclinical data that I'll go into over the next couple of slides. And then the third area is in cardiovascular disease, where uh, approximately two years ago we entered into uh, a landmark collaboration with Bristol Myers Squibb uh, with a lead program in congestive heart failure, as well as in approximately nine additional targets uh, that are in the process of being designated. We actually have four uh, targets that have been designated thus far. So these are really the three major legs of our stool. Uh, I'll just spend a little bit of time uh, going through some recent uh, updates. So earlier this year, we received breakthrough designation for AMT60, which is our AAV5 um, factor IX uh, gene therapy that is currently being tested in, uh, in clinical development in a phase one, two study. Uh, we also announced earlier this week that we received prime designation from, uh, from the EMA. And I think these are uh, reflective of the strong proof of concept data that we've generated in the phase one, two study that show very clearly that AMT60 is superior to the gold standard, which is high dose factor nine replacement therapy, and the safety of our product, which we think is uh, critically important for this particular indication. So we look forward to working with the regulators and have been working uh, in particular with the FDA uh, to expedite this program into a registrational study. Um, this slide here just reflects some of the data that we announced uh, and presented at CHDI in Malta earlier this week. I think what this data uh, in a nutshell shows in one of the largest animal models that is available for testing, it's a transgenic a uh, mini pig model um, that we um, received from CHDI, which is one of the largest Huntington's disease uh, organizations, uh, we were able to demonstrate that uh, by doing a one-time administration of an AV5 that is loaded with a microRNA, we, we were able to successfully silence the mutated Huntington gene uh, with widespread distribution throughout the brain. So we were seeing between 50 to 80% knockdown of the hunting teen gene uh, in the striatum, the thalamus, uh, and up to even 40% knockdown in the cortical regions, which weren't even transduced um, in terms of direct infusion. 
So it goes to show that um, AAV5, and this is something that we've known because we've used AAV5 in, um, in a Sanfilippo B study and other preclinical studies, that AAV5 has very strong distribution across the brain. And seeing this level of knockdown um, gives us excitement that it has the potential to be therapeutically relevant and uh, it was also well tolerated with no safety effects. So the, uh, the next steps for this program is um, in the second half of this year, we're gonna begin a definitive uh, GLP toxicology study. We've already initiated discussions with, uh, with the regulators uh, in particular in, uh, in the EMA, and have an aligned view about that study. And the expectation is that that work is going to be enabling of an IND uh, that we expect to file in 2018, with the goal of being the first gene therapy in the world that is um, in testing of humans. So a lot of exciting things going on. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into that in a little bit more detail with the Q&A, so I'll go join Steve. Thanks, Matt. Maybe going back to hemophilia B, uh, you touched on it when talking about the prime designation, but maybe just contextualize the unmet need for us and, and where do you think the, the bar is for emerging therapies like your own? Sure, yeah. So the, uh, actually one of the panelists actually I think went through this. Um, hemophilia B is, um, is, a, is an indication that obviously is being served today. It's not a fully unmet clinical need. I think the issue is that most of these patients are uh, severe or moderately severe hemophiliacs, and the, the current treatment regime is to provide high-dose uh, prophylaxis to these patients because they're susceptible to spontaneous bleeding. And the uh, high-dose prophylaxis that is currently approved, and even the ones that are longer-acting, uh, they have relatively short half-lives. So the level of factor nine in circulation is constantly declining and often rapidly after infusion. And so I think not only does that provide um, a poor quality of life, but despite the fact that a lot of these patients are on uh, high dose prophylaxis, they still experience breakthrough bleeding. So there's a cost to the healthcare system, there's a cost to their quality of life, and despite being on these regimens, they still experience quite a bit of bleeding. So what gene therapy represents is the ability for one-time administration, you're talking about probably a 30-minute IV infusion, an outpatient procedure that can provide stable factor IX activity for that patient uh, in a durable manner, allow them to get off a of prophylaxis, and actually still, despite being off prophylaxis, decrease their annual ble bleeding rate. So I think that's really what it offers uh, for these patients. Maybe just remind us, uh, what is your clinical data and, and how many patients have you treated now? Sure. So we initiated a phase one, two study about, uh, about two years ago. Uh, we've treated thus far 10 patients across two dose cohorts, five patients each cohort. Uh, back in December uh, of last year at ASH, we presented one year follow-up on the low dose cohort and six months follow-up on the high dose cohort. And what we saw is that um, there were nine patients that prior to gene transfer had been on high dose prophylaxis somewhere between one and three times a week. Uh, there was one on demand patient. Of those nine patients, eight patients uh, through the last observation date have completely discontinued prophylaxis. The, in the low dose cohort, there was an 86% per, uh, reduction in the amount of factor IX replacement therapy that they were using after gene transfer, and in the high-dose cohort, over 96 aggregate weeks of data, there was only one spontaneous bleed, and it represented a 76% uh, a reduction in that annualized bleeding rate. So uh, very strong data. Uh, the other thing that I'll say is that we've had very durable expression. So out to a year, we've had very stable factor IX activity levels. There was no patient that uh, lost any efficacy. And most importantly, from a safety point of view, there was no uh, immune responses to the capsid, and the therapy was very well tolerated. Seems to be a lot of uh, debate out there about uh, factor nine levels. Is this, is this the right metric, or is it, and you talk a lot about reducing bleeding, and is that the way the regulators think about it? Is that how clinicians think about it at the, at the end of the day? Yeah, our, uh, our, our 
lead investigator in our study, Professor Liebeck, says, I don't treat numbers, I treat patients. Um, and I will tell you that if you, if you know any hemophiliacs, um, I would say the overwhelming majority of them don't even know what their factor nine activities level, factor nine activity level is at any given point in time. So in the end, the value to the patient, um, in our view, the value to, in, in the way the regulators look at it, is going to be in allowing patients to get off a of prophylaxis and controlling or reducing or eliminating their annualized bleeding rate. Um, we know, because we already had an end of phase two meeting with the, with the FDA, that they will continue to look at the endpoints for gene therapy as they looked at the endpoints for factor nine replacement therapy. And the primary endpoint has been annualized bleeding rate. Uh, we just don't know what factor nine activity level means. Uh, we do know uh, from prior gene therapy studies, our own study, as well as um, the, the history, the natural history of the disease, that between five and 10% of factor nine activity level typically eliminates the risk of spontaneous bleeding and allows patients to get off of, of prophylaxis. So we do think this is the relevant way to look at it for patients, and we do, we do know that this is how the regulators are gonna be looking at it. As you guys prepare for the registration enabling study, uh, you talked about endpoints, maybe just at a high level and it's early, how are you thinking about some of the other parameters? Um, and you know, what are the kind of gating steps to be getting the, the next trial? Yeah, so I think that, um, I think our view, and, and obviously this is, these are discussions that are still ongoing with the agencies, so we don't know, right? But I think our view about the study is that uh, it is likely going to be uh, a study that it does not require a separate control arm. So I think we will have some form of, of the patient being their own control. Um, I think that is likely going to wind up being in the form of some kind of lead-in to develop um, a historical basis. I think the study would probably, probably be defined as a non-inferiority study, where you're looking at the non-inferiority of gene therapy to uh, high-dose uh, factor nine replacement therapy. Uh, we think that it would probably be in the range of somewhere between 30 and 60 patients, um, that there would likely be um, probably at least one year follow-up in terms of what the, what the agencies would require. Um, so it's, it's actually, um, it, it's, it's a reasonable study that I think is reflective of, again, the the, the, the high-dose uh, factor nine replacement therapies that are out there, uh, and we think it's, uh, it's actually quite manageable. One thing uh, that seems to be unique about AAV5, which you're using for, for hemophilia, is the low seroprevalence of, of antibodies. Can you maybe just talk about uh, what you're seeing in terms of the screening rate and, and what you think the prevalence to neutralizing antibodies might be? Sure, actually this is, um, I, I would say there's probably two elements related to AV5 that we think are really critical, very important to understand. I think the, they, they both revolve around the fact that AV5, uh, the histology of, of AV5 is very different than all the wild type vectors that are out there. So the evolution of AV5 was distinctly different and is actually not really a human born virus. So the exposure um, to humans over the years has been significantly lower, we believe, than a number of the other wild type vectors. So what that means is really two things. One is that the immune system uh, for most patients has not been primed. So uh, there is no pre-existing neutralizing antibodies. And why is that important? because patients that have received exposure to it, even if it's environmental, um, are not candidates for gene therapies with that vector. Uh, we've done a significant amount of work really understanding the prevalence of neutralizing antibody, uh, antibodies and the titers that matter in terms of determining clinical benefit. And we believe that AV5 has the lowest level of preexisting neutralizing antibodies. Uh, we think it could be as low as 5% of the general population. And that means that um, a significantly higher number of, let's say, hemophiliacs can be addressable by our product versus other vectors where there's been publicly uh, disclosed information that says neutralizing antibodies could be as high as 40 to 50 percent. The second factor that's really important that is correlated to this 
immunological piece is that the vector seems to be very well tolerated within the body for the reasons that I just alluded to. So the provocation of an immune response to the capsid uh, is, is very low, right? So we've treated actually 22 patients with AAV5, 18 of which have been administered IV systemically to the liver, and we've seen no T cell activation related to the capsid. And I think that's quite distinctively different than the other studies that have been, um, that have had data. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I think that's all we have time for. Very, uh, very helpful. Great. Thank you. Thank you.